All right. Well, I think we've got enough in here. Uh, we, we're going to get rolling. So thank you everyone for being on tonight. Much appreciated. Um, obviously, we've struck a bit of a chord here tonight. Uh, so we're anticipating uh, our most popular webinar of uh, yet. And as a bale grazer myself, we've utilized uh, uh, bale grazing on our farm for, oh, the better part of 20 years and uh, have some influencers not only on the, the webinar tonight, but also um, that are watching. So a really great way to uh, have a conversation, ask the questions you've been thinking or wondering about uh, the practice of bale grazing. So uh, I'm gonna start with housekeeping notes. Um, so uh, again, we encourage, of course, as many questions as possible. So everyone that registered uh, wrote a question down. I've kind of summarized uh, uh, questions. I've got about a dozen here, kind of the most popular ones uh, that we were seeing time and time again. So the questions go in the Q&A and not the chat. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what it is, but honestly, I'm doing this webinar. Normally I've got my assistant Trav just to my right here. Uh, but I am in Edmonton, Alberta, and he's in uh, Clearwater, Manitoba. So uh, God help us. I'm going to get through this uh, tonight. So questions in Q&A, not the chat. I'm going to pick the best two questions at the end and very much encourage uh, get your questions in as you think of them, because I've got my uh, Q&A box open. And as questions are coming in, based on what the panelists are saying, I'm just going to kind of jot them down. And then, of course, uh, we have uh, kind of a Q&A at the end uh, where we just have a discussion, just kind of the four of us just kick back and, and uh, uh, answer as openly and honestly uh, the questions you guys have as possible. Um, so these are our three panelists tonight. Um, we're very, very lucky. So the the first bale grazing we did, I think it was called uh, Evolution of Bale Grazing Volume 1. Uh, we gained a bit of a following on YouTube. So we thought, hey, if the, the crowd is uh, demanding it, Maybe we should do another one. So we're fortunate now. Uh, we've got a panelist from each province and uh, and just going through the viewers as as uh, I was waiting here. Uh, it seems like we've got a pretty even scale of farms from Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta. So again, really great practice, something that we utilize on our farm and uh, a great idea. So I'm I'm looking forward to a night of uh, learning and, uh, and education. So the first panelist we have up is uh, Luke Tellier. Um, from uh, Bonneville, Bonneville, Alberta. So Luke, thanks a lot for coming on. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about who's in the picture here and uh, a little bit about your farm. Okay, well, hi, this is pretty exciting. I've never really done this before, so this is kind of cool. Um, anyways, yeah, my name is Luke Tellia from Bonneville, Alberta. That's about as far north as you can go uh, in the northeast part of the world. <clears throat> and uh we run a bunch of cows, uh, run about 800 cows. And um, yeah, we calve in May, June. Um, of those cows, we have a uh, 100 purebred Charlotte cows and we run them all together. Everybody calves in May, June. I'm not about to start calving the purebreds and then the heifers and then the commercials. So May 1st, everybody starts, beginning of May, everybody starts calving. So after a while, I farm uh, with my son, Dylan. Uh, so it's a generational farm. We started in the twenties with my grandpa, then my dad, myself, and now my son, Dylan. And, um, yeah, so it's, uh, beef purebred and we crop as well. And then, so one of the reasons we got into grazing and we do all kinds of grazing systems. So we do stockpile, uh, corn, swath and bale grazing. When we started calving on grass about 20 some years ago, feeding cows all winter got pretty old, pretty quick. So we said, there's got to be a better way. So that's how we started. We just kind of started slowly in every program and just kind of expanded from there. And I'm a fan of all three. They, you know, in our part of the world, we can get a lot of snow. Um, winters are long and they're tough. And the reason I do all of them is just, I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. So that's why we do them all. And, you know, in a year like this year, where we don't have a lot of snow, I would actually like to have all swath grazing, but Unfortunately, we can't predict the weather all that much, right? So um, they, they all work for me. And bale grazing is one of my favorite. I, I really like it. It works. Um, um, we've, we've tried everything over the years. You know, we've tried small and we've expanded and we've just about tried everything. We've tried not so good hay. We've tried straw, molasses. We've big fields, small fields, electric fence. We've tried it all. Why so, don't you, Luke, why don't, we, why don't you talk about where you first heard the idea and... 
when you first brought the idea back to the farm, what, what did it look like and maybe how it's evolved from there? Um, I don't know how we first heard about it. I just talking to producers and, you know, um, I guess that's how it came about. And then the best way to, you know, you can talk to a hundred guys and they're going to give you, you're going to get a hundred different ideas. Right. So I just took all the best ones at the time and, and started playing with it. Right. And tweaked it all, along the way. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's how I kind of started. So I'm curious, I mean, you can get to, uh, we've got a few pictures here from, from your farm about, uh, okay. I want to know what's going on in here, but uh, I am a little bit curious, which came on the farm first? Was it corn grazing, swath grazing, or bale grazing? And and I guess, when did okay. you kind of implement the three together? Okay, uh, I can't see the pictures. Like, is there a way for me to see the pictures or? Uh, that is a good question. Aaron, can you see the pictures? It might just be because Luke's on his phone. Yeah, I can't. Oh, okay. okay, sorry, Luke, so I... Luke we got, we got uh, uh, maybe try turning your phone on the side. Okay, yeah, it is, yeah. Can you still yep. hear me? Yep, you betcha, we got you. Okay, well, th these pictures here are, uh, well, just to show you how much snow we can get. So that's a picture of a gate there. So, I mean, and it's hilly country in our part of the world, so you have to be careful where you put your, we put our cows as far back as we could one year, and it happened to be one of the worst winters we ever had. So that was some of the stuff we had to deal with, so it wasn't very much fun. And then a picture on the right is actually, you know, and wildlife could be a big problem as well. And this year's a, most winters are pretty good. We don't have a big problem with wildlife. But last year and a year before, we had really tough winters. And that those are not cows. Those are deer. Those are white-tailed deer in that field. So just to show you how many we had to deal with. Like I say, that's not common. Every year is different. But uh, And that was not a bale grazing field. That was left over of the corn. So that's oh, what's okay. going on in those pictures. Yeah, yeah. So on a, on a, I know a standard year and it sounds like your, uh, like your farm and your system is obviously very flexible. What do you, what are you using, uh, for bale grazing? And, uh, I guess what's in an ideal world, what would you, what would you use every year? Uh, well, you know, we, uh, most, we try to use the best here that we can, but we're cursed with some reed canary grass in some areas. So we use some of that. It's not the best, but it works. We've got to test it and if feed, it's okay. But the cows sure don't like it, right? But we spread it out a little bit. We have three different fields at the moment with 200 bales in each field. And uh, we you know, we spread those bales out. It's actually always a pretty good indicator when you're just about done because they'll clean everything right up and they'll leave those till the very last. So uh, they, they, they have their place. I don't love it, but it's what we have, right? So I got to work with it. So what land are you bale grazing on? Uh, we're, you know, there's a couple spots that we hit year after year, but the, the bigger field we hit, we move it around all the time. I try to stay there no more than four or five years. And then I keep moving because at the end of the day, I think bale grazing where it shines is what it does to your old pastures, right? It builds up your soil. Your grass is amazing. So I'll hit a field four or five years that I just keep moving around. Try to spread that manure as much as I well can. Why don't you talk about what's going on uh, in this photo and what you're feeding? And I, I, I've got a follow-up question as well. Yeah, there's just the, the girls feeding there. Uh, I think that picture was taken this year. I think my son Dylan took that picture. Uh, the good we're talking about reed canary. Most of the bales we use are a little bit of alfalfa, you know, fescue brome mix. Hay is what we usually use. Or like to, the, so, of course, the better the hay, the better they clean up, like always, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I, where I was going with this was, uh, you know, the better quality of the feed, the better they clean it up, whether it's in the field or in a bale feeder in a corral as well. My neighbor, uh, God love him, I, I don't think he's on tonight, but he's a really good buddy of mine. But he, he likes to, uh, to bust my balls a little. He calls it bale wasting. So for somebody that's not used to the practice, maybe just touch on quickly what you see as far as waste and, you know, the, the correlation between uh, quality of feed and amount of waste. Um, yeah. You know what? That's everybody's, that's the biggest question. I think that's what everybody's scared of, but I don't really look at it as waste. You, they will clean it up. you got to train your cows to clean it up a little bit. And towards the end, of course, well, we always watch them. We don't just leave them in there and close their eyes for 10, 20, 30 days, whatever it's supposed to, you have to watch them, right? And when they start cleaning up, we'll supplement them with a load of silage or whatever, just force them to clean up. So I'll start with maybe, 
you know, 40% of their ration with silage just to help out. And they, they go finish cleaning up. And, you know, I just don't want to lose condition. And how much is, I don't really look at it as waste. They do clean up. Of course, when you have bad hay like reed canary, they'll leave more behind. But on good hay, it's amazing how much they clean up. What the percentage of waste is, I don't have an exact number for you, but it's 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 very minimal. And your cows will clean it up. And of course, the later you calve, once the snow is gone, we'll turn those cows back out and let them scrounge. And it's amazing what they'll do. They'll just keep going back and they'll just keep picking away, picking away, picking away and cleaning it up. And of course, it helps when you're so, when you calve in May, June. The longer the grazing season, April ro rolls around and we put them back in there and it's amazing how much they'll clean up. So what, uh, um, maybe just break down for me on an, again, an ideal year, because uh, I did do a little bit of research. You've got a really excellent video. I don't, Keegan showed me it. I'm not sure if it's on uh, YouTube or where it is, but you're talking about the, the ideal uh, uh, feed for your cattle is stockpiled and then swath and bale grazing and corn grazing. So what does an ideal year look like for you guys based on, you know, maybe you get, you know, a, a foot and a half of snow on, on December 1st. On December 1st. Yeah. You know, like by then we're just about done our stockpile and then we move into swaths and uh, then we'll hit the corn, then we'll hit the bales. And the reason I like to hit the bales last is because they're usually in an older sod field. So if we do happen to get a melt, they're not going to chew up all the fields. Right. It's a, it's a harder sod field and I don't worry about them chewing it up or beating the field up all that much. That's the reason we hit the bales last. And uh, yeah, um, but of course every year is well, so different. Do you want to, there's, I, there's I know, and that's why I used, air, I used air quotes saying uh, on a normal year because uh, I mean, the nice thing about the system uh, that you've implemented too is it's flexible. Uh, I was actually up in Bonneville on... I don't know what today is. I think I was there yesterday. Uh, oh, so really? Every Saturday I was up there, and yeah, you guys, you guys don't have a ton of snow. I bet. I mean, you probably were grazing well into December. Yes. Yeah. 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 We were. We were very lucky. Yeah. So we hit the swaths right before Christmas. So that was kind of nice. And we we're just hitting. We're just starting to hit the corn now. Just so you yeah. guys actually haven't started bale grazing yet this year. So when when uh, ideally... no, not no, I'll I'll keep it till last, like I said, yeah, yeah. When ideally will you be will you be uh, uh, starting bale grazing and and then when will you end the bale grazing and and ideally kick kick cows back out on stockpile? Usually, usually, uh, we hit the corn about now. Usually, I want to hit the bales about beginning of March, and then my goal is always to try to get to beginning of April. That's my goal. And then, like I say, we, we calve on grass in May, June, we stockpile the grass then. So then they'll hit that stockpile. So my April month is more my cleanup month. You know, I'll, I will supplement my cows with silage, with a good mineral package before they calve. And I call that kind of my cleanup month. I will feed them, but that's my cleanup month. And then they're back on, then they're back on stockpile grass in May for calving. So uh, I guess I'll start off with the first crowdsourced question uh luke don't worry aaron i got i've saved a lot for you uh, th uh first two questions or uh uh two of uh, the first few questions um what do the cows use for bedding how do you stop the cows from laying in the hay do you bed no we don't bed we don't bed our cows no and maybe just uh give some rationale I, and and uh i've got a good answer for it too so uh uh if it's not completely satisfying, I'll follow up. Okay, yeah. Uh, they have lots of room. They'll they'll go find a shelter. If there's a storm, they'll go find shelter. There's some trees. We have a lot of fence lines that are fenced off. A lot of, you know, we have a lot of shelter for them. They have room, and it's amazing where they'll go find, uh, you know, if if they'll, they'll, they'll just go away from the wind if they have to. And I, I just, I don't think we have to better cows. I'm sure no, they'll lay on the hay a little bit, but they don't, you know, it's not, it's not a problem. No, I think on a, on a calm night, you'll find them all laying out on the hay, depending on where it is. Like if the hay is yeah. out, out, out in the wind, but when the, as long as they have access to shelter or bush, or in our case, we use a, a, a valley, 
I mean, on a windy day, you'll just even it doesn't matter where you bed, they're gonna go wherever it is to get out of the wind anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, and we're uh, and yeah, and we're lucky. We have a lot of tree lines and a lot of bush lines, and we have lots of natural shelter for them. So that that really helps us. Cool. Well, uh, uh, that's the last slide I got for you, Luke. You got uh, any? Obviously, you're sticking around for question time, and we've got a, a ton of questions pouring in. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, the pictures you, you gave us, and stick around till the end, and uh, uh, we're going to answer some questions. Okay. All right, Aaron, you're up. So uh, a little background on Aaron, uh, for better or worse, Aaron's been a massive influence on myself and, and our farm as far as bale grazing. Uh, I was just telling him before we came on, uh, before I met him, we were doing three, five, and seven day moves. Uh, and after having one conversation with Aaron and how their uh, 20 day or three week, uh, uh, three week moves were working, uh, I came home and we switched and and there is no going back. So Aaron, why don't you talk about, uh, uh, introduce yourself, talk about the farm. And uh, I guess in a few years, uh, how you got going with bale grazing. Sure. You can hear me all right. I can hear you, but just a heads up, I think we've got a bit of a delay. So uh, if you see me bouncing pictures around, we just got a bit of a, a delay and I'm going to try and uh, match as best I can. Okay, right on. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, I guess you guys obviously aren't sick of me quite yet. Having me on again. So <laughs> I'll uh, roll through what we do again. And um, maybe I'll just start with a, a disclaimer that I think is a bit necessary like, I think bale grazers in general sometimes get a bad rap um, for the production practice. And and they, they, I don't know, other people seem to think that bale grazers think that it's the only way to do it and that it's the right way to do it. But it's just one way of doing it, for winter feeding, and it's, it's not the right way. Um, it just has to be the right way for you. And so my advice to do for anybody would be not to do something because someone else is doing it, but to do it because it's right for your own situation. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> a bit about our farm. We have, um, we're up by Shelmouth, Manitoba, which is up by the ski hill at Assisipi, right on the Manitoba Saskatchewan border. And we're in the Assiniboine Valley and we have some land in the bottom in the valley, some transitional land, and then some top land. Uh, we have about 550 Angus cattle and it's a cow calf operation. We also sell some breeding stock and we do a little bit of direct marketing of meat as well. Um, as far as who's here, it's my brother Shane and me are the primary, uh, I guess, managers of the operation. Now my my parents are still involved in the operation too. Um, and they they live at the, kind of the, the main farm site. A um, bit about bale grazing and, and the history and why we started doing it. We took a holistic management course in 2005. And at that course, there was some people there that were already doing it. Um, and we just got some ideas from them. And at the time, uh, the the reasons or considerations for doing it were, were financial at the time, looking at uh, maybe a cost savings or a cheaper way of doing um, wintering of cattle. And also um, the, the labor and quality of life at the time was also a consideration. So those were some, I guess, um, catalysts for change for us. And we just started out, um, you know, doing baby steps. We, the first bale grazing we did was more larger grid styles. And then we'd move uh, a hot wire every three to five days. Uh, we experimented also with leaving calves on um, into December, January, and February. Um, Presently, we wean first week of December, and then after the three-day, like the fence line weaning is done, the cows go to the bale graze. So that's usually around December 7th, and we budget um, 120 days worth of feed. So that runs December 7th, April 7th, and then after that feed's done, we move to stockpile grazing, and that's part of our system and our, our annual forage management plan. Um, there will be, you know, every year is different, so depending on the year, Sometimes we'll get grazing sooner. Uh, sometimes we'll have to supplement even after the bales are gone on certain years if there's heavy snow or crusting that we can't get to the stockpile grazing. Um, Aaron, maybe, 
Let, sorry, I got a bit of a delay, so I wanted to hop in sooner. I'm just, I'm going to move some pictures along, but I mean, you yep. and Luca both touched on stockpiled grazing. I think probably we should have a stockpiled grazing webinar at some point too, but why don't you talk a little bit about, uh, just, I know this is asking uh, a detailed question to answer fast, so as fast as you can, just touch yep. on a little bit of your grazing plan to actually access that, because there's I know there's people on tonight that are saying, well, April 7th. Uh, that's not going to work uh, in my operation. And, you know, why not just take all that, uh, that plant biomass in the fall or uh, early winter and then just feed the cows longer in the spring? Well, I'd graze year round if I could, but in yeah. Manitoba, it's, it's just not practical. Um, so we, I mean, our target is basically for the minimum amount of days that we have to winter or feed mechanic, like feed fed feed that's that's our target and we have been averaging about 110 days so a little bit shy of the 120 and some years we'll have a little bit of of bales left over but that's okay we'll just use them the following year but in terms of like you know trying to figure it out initially i mean you have to analyze your land base and see where you're at and if you don't have like if you only have you know enough grass for six months of grazing um well you need to make some changes if you want to graze eight months you either have to get rid of some cows, you have to buy or rent some more land, or you have to improve your existing land base and grow more forage. And you can do that through grazing management practices. We, on our land, since we've implemented adaptive multi-paddock grazing or holistic managed grazing, we've basically increased our forage production on our perennial pastures by about two to two and a half times. So that's... I mean, you, you can't put a value on that because I mean, well, you can, but, but it's, it's like, you don't, you don't have to go out and buy or rent more land and you have that same extra forage. So you have to start planning and seeing kind of how you can manage your, your annual forage resource. Um, and that, and that's how you'll, you'll get to that point. I think a lot of people think it's, it's not even possible to graze um eight months of the year in manitoba but it definitely is we're doing it other people are doing it too it's just not the norm amen so uh I, I, it is a bale grazing webinar i was gonna ask a follow-up question but tell me what's going on here in the photo here okay so this photo is just of uh bale grazing aftermath after we moved them they're just walking through this uh pod going back to water and so I was just going by with the snowmobile. So I took a picture and it just, this picture shows you a lot of people will say, well, sometimes we get too much snow or do you, I even other people have suggested, well, I'll have to plow paths between my bales so the cows can access the bales. No, you don't need to. The cows will find the feed. And as you can see here, they just kind of leave like icebergs where they don't touch them. So the cow, cows are very resourceful. They'll, they'll find the feed. And I guess I should mention too. Our you, pod, give, our, go ahead. Sorry, uh, no, I was just going to say, because uh, the question always is, and I'm gonna, we're going to talk about it lots tonight, is waste, waste, waste. This, you know, What are we losing in waste? Because that's really the argument. It's great we're not starting a tractor every day or, or only have to move every 20 days, but the trade-off is we're going to waste a bunch. So talk about uh, what you fed in this pod here and, and do your damnedest to, 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 to talk about waste percentages. Because I'm looking at this photo and I'm not seeing much for waste. Yeah, this was mostly hay. So we we use hay mostly, so alfalfa grass mix. We will mix in some, some green feed oats at times and some straw, like two-year-old straw that's a little more palatable. But our rule is never more than a third of the total amount of bales to a pod. So we don't want more than a third of, of the off types that aren't hay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> what we're looking at here was the hay portion of the pod. As far as waste goes, bale grazing always looks like more than other feeding systems because you have all the shit concentrated in one spot. I mean, if you feed out with, uh, you roll out a bale or you, you take a bale shredder, the cows are going to come over there, they're going to eat, and then they're going to go somewhere else to shit. Where in the bale grazing, that's where they do it all. So you're you're, you're not only seeing the, res the, the residue of the feed, but you're also seeing all the manure as well. So it's a little deceiving, but... And I, I don't have, we've never put down a blanket and sifted and weighed the feed, but I mean, we're probably in the five to 
on average. Certain times it can be better than that. But I, I've heard lots of people say that bale grazing is 30% waste. And this is my only comment on that. If it's 30%, you're doing it wrong. I will agree. So, yeah. so I, I mean, and the, the Luke brought it up, uh, you know, feeding reed canary grass and we feed everything. Like uh, I, I love a diversity of plants growing in a field, but I always like a diversity of options for our, for our livestock as well. So it's like, we never ever give our cows an option of one type of feed. Like, you know, quite yeah. often it's, uh, you know, full season, two-year-old straw, some slough hay, some tame hay. Uh, I bet on the reed canary grass, uh, I bet it might be 30%. Uh, however, uh, I, you know, I, I just don't see a whole ton of difference putting that same reed canary grass in a bale feeder and having the, the animals stand there all day because they just, they're not, I don't know. I, I don't know why a metal ring would, would help that cow consume that or make that plant biomass more digestible. So I, oh, to it, me, it's six of one doesn't of the other. Yeah, it's Except true. Except like one of them, said. I don't pay to haul it out. Yeah, it's true. They will they will clean up better, feed better. And and it's like that in every system, not just bale grazing. But you know, so, with 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 stuff like straw or reed canary, a lot of times it I mean it's a function of availability and what you have or what you can source. And sometimes you just you can't source what you want. So you have to make do with some other alternative stuff. When the cows are getting down to like uh say two year old straw, uh, do you guys ever supplement with with protein or molasses or, or peas or anything? No, we don't. What's um, the, what's the most time you'd be comfortable with, with cows consuming straw for? Well, they, I mean, they will leave the straw until like on a 21 day move, they probably won't even touch the straw until like, you know, day 14 and then they'll start yeah. on it. But even then there's, it's not like they've, eaten the hay completely so there is a bit of a mixing of a ration there as well so they're not just on straw but yeah um i i don't know if i can have a real answer for that i mean probably you wouldn't want you know cattle that cows that are in calf to be consuming only straw for more than three days that that would probably be a limit but for sure well aaron just talk about what's going on here with your pods how are you deciding where to set out bales? How many bales? What's the what's the formula? Yeah, so you can see we, I mean, there's no standard grid pattern per se, but where what you can't see in that picture is the existing cross fencing in that paddock. So it's just single strand high tensile. And so all those all those pods are actually divided by fencing. And we're just trying to to cover, and some of them are not like square shapes. So we're just trying to make sure that we're getting coverage from year to year. And our, our rule with bale grazing is we never we, we never want to go back to the same place ever when we're bale grazing. We want to we want to hit it hard. Our, our placement's higher than most, but we never want to come back to it ever again. We can only cover uh, about 40 acres per winter the way we're doing it now. And we have a perennial land base of about 5000 acres. So that's that's over 100 years. So, I mean, we're we're not going to get there. And, and our, our other uh, strategy is to bale graze on our poorest land first to improve it. So that, that's part of the strategy. And we so want the last... them, well, sorry, just one other thing. We want them far yeah. enough apart too, so there's no temptation, you know, for them to look across the fence and, and you know, you have those couple problem cows that jump over. If you have them this far apart, you generally do not have any issues whatsoever. I, and if people take nothing out of this webinar, that was the biggest improvement we made to our bale grazing uh, uh, paddocks. We used to just put every single bale and, you, you know, you'd kind of make a ration. You know, this row was hay, this row was, say, cover crops, this row was two-year-old straw. Uh, and then you, you put your fences the other way. Having those bales six feet apart and those cows are, are cleaning up residue and they can look and see 200 bales there, there is far too much temptation. And when the snow gets deep enough, it's like... My old man's changing the fence without ever shutting it off. Well, if he's doing it with his bare hands, the cow's not getting the shock either. And it was just, we were always chasing cows and re-rolling up wire and putting a new fence and grounds. What you're looking at in front of you was the uh, biggest change, positive change we made in our winter feeding system. Just make bigger pods and spread them out because 
Aaron's right that the it's the temptation factor. If they're just walking by it and it's 200 yards off off in the distance, it's a it's a game changer. They just they're not getting out anymore. Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm this video, Aaron. Uh, hopefully, this video works. It's honestly one of my favorites. Um, you can see that, okay? Yep. Cool. Well, uh, obviously, this is a time lapse of what's going on, but maybe uh, just talk over a bit. Tell us how many days we're looking at here. Um, yeah, whatever. I'm sure you've watched this video lots and had lots of questions on it. So I'll let you do some of the narration. Yeah. So I just got a trail cam and I, uh, I can't remember how many pictures it took per day, but it's basically for the full duration of the 21 day feeding period. And this particular example was like probably the worst, um, the worst example I could have done because, uh, it was actually quite warm in the last 10 days of this of this, um, of this bale grace pod. So they, the cleanup was pr probably not nearly as good as some of our other pods, but I mean, it's, it's still pretty reasonable, but it just, it goes to show you cows come and go. They're very content. And one other thing about the 21 day pods and what we found, and this is, this is a huge benefit. Um, it's not a perfect system either, but there's virtually no competition between cows that you don't have to pull skinnies. You don't have to worry about older cows, younger cows, Everybody has feed in front of them all, like 95% of the time. So it, it really reduces the competition factor of those boss cows. So, I mean, to that point, um, I mean, I see it all the time. And and the first picture that we opened with was your cows grazing in that pod. You ever, people really, do, they don't believe me when I tell them, I'm like, cows will go into a pod of 120 bales, which is what we're setting ours out at. And there will be 60 bales completely gone and they will hardly have cracked into any of the others. You got any rhyme or reason why that is? Is it better smell? What is it? And I've, I've actually found as we've bale grazed over the years, that effect seems to magnify like the cows, they just know the system. Like I, I don't remember seeing that so evident earlier on, but once they learn the system, they really do that. Um, I think it's two things. They know what feeds good feed. And it's also uh, a palatability kind of ease of eating. Like cows are lazy too. Like they, you know, they will eat the bales that are easiest to eat first. Like in terms of what they can pull apart. If a bale is a little bit tight, th they'll leave it till the end. But they will, they they can crack it open, but they will leave it longer. So it's a combination of yeah. those two factors. It's pretty cool to see actually. For sure, you do, you never see uh like let's just say if there were two hundred bales and two hundred cows, it you're never gonna see one cow in each bale. You're gonna see fifteen no. cows crowded around one bale, and they're not gonna touch uh seventy five percent of. Yeah, and there's there's probably there's a big social aspect to that too, but I mean I I don't know we can't communicate with them so we can't ask them that. <laughs> no, we can observe. So what's no. what's what's going on, what's going on here? Uh, so we just talked about these big pods, and now we're seeing a wire across. Yeah, so that was this year and our first, it was really mild early, right? So we started, I think, December 10th or 12th or something like that. And the full, the whole month of December was really mild. <clears throat> so we decided to split our first pod and we split off. We only gave them access to a third of it. So we will be a little bit flexible under certain conditions. So what you're seeing to the right there is the aftermath right before I moved them, pulled the wire and then gave them access to the remaining two thirds of the pod. So, uh, Aaron, we've had a few questions here uh, about bale spacing and just c chatting with you guys beforehand. I know Carter's got a different answer that's more similar to mine, but uh, we had three questions, boom, 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 wondering uh, how do you decide how far to spread the bales? And have you ever adjusted it? What's the rhyme or reason there? Well, we experimented a lot early on with different spacings, but we've been doing what we're doing now for probably... 10 to 12 years and we haven't altered it so it's as tight as we can make like before when we they were a little farther apart you'd get that ring effect where you you'd, you'd see the ring from the, the bale residue and then there'd be gaps of of no residue and which is fine and like i and i see steve kenyon has said don't worry about that just come back the next year and fill in those holes which you can do but our we've chosen to just put them a little bit tighter you get as you can see on the right there you get complete coverage you don't see any rings whatsoever and then we never want to come back. That's our goal. And so they're spaced, I don't know, center to center, they'd be like uh, 15 feet apart, something like that. 
So they're they're fairly close. The straightest lines I've ever seen a cattle uh, cattle producer do. They it's are amazing. impressive. Did somebody train? Jason must have been a grain farmer at some point in his life. <laughs> well, he likes his straight lines, which is fine. It's all good. <laughs> uh, so what's going on here? Uh, this so so this this is the effect that you were talking about. Like that's a whole pod. There's no there's no wire in between there. So they just came into that pod, and you can see that they're kind of mobbing up, and they're they're just going after certain bales first. And I can't really remember where we put what bales here, but obviously they're just going to where they want first. Um, that was last a few questions. I should have uh, I should have asked Luke this question as well, but we'll we'll come back in the uh, uh, at the end here. What kind of twine are you using? I guess I know your situation is a little unique because you're buying a lot of hay, um, but I assume you're buying lots of different hay, and I know you guys are making some. But what are you using for twine? Uh, and I guess if it's plastic, how are you getting it off, and when? So so we we make some hay too, and what goes to the bale grazing is the stuff that we make. And then we buy from one supplier that's a twine only guy. And so between our, what we make and what he we buy from him, that's our complete bale graze hay supply. We buy from another supplier and he's a net wrap guy. All that feed comes home. And that's the stuff that we'll feed to our other management classes like uh, wean calves, uh, heifers and bulls, uh, herd bulls and our sale bulls. But everything that goes to the bale graze is twine only. And it's just way easier to manage because... You don't have to tip the bales off to remove the, the net. You just cut cut them, loop and tie them on the other side and then just yank them out with a with a quad hitch. You haven't uh, heard of a revolutionary thing called sizal twine? I have heard of it, but <laughs> it, it's hard to convince guys that you're buying hay from to use sizal. They, he, just, he just doesn't want to do it and, and that's fine. So it's all good. I mean, sizal does cost does um, does cost I think twice as much as regular twine. So there's an additional cost you're, to it. You're wrong. It's closer to eight times. Eight times. I think it costs us like three dollars and twenty five cents a bale. I guess I haven't bought plastic in so long. I don't know what the price of plastic is, but sizal is by far the most expensive. Is I tell it, people all the time, like I I don't know how high it would have to get though before I switched because uh geez i hate plastic twine has it always been that high for a difference no no the last like five years it's like it, it's just gone it's gone insane in price it costs us about um a dollar a bale to remove all our oh, stuff so there, it's it's over three times yeah yeah so any final words you're obviously sticking around for uh for question time but uh you got one word of advice or one one final thoughts uh to people that are thinking about trying just just to experiment lots and try different things. Go see people that are doing it. Uh, go on webinars like this. Get lots of advice. Try different things. That's about it. Cool. Well, stick around for question time. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Yep. Sorry. Oh, Carter, you're there. Perfect. Nice. I was just you told me to hide things. myself, so I was hiding. No, no, that's good. You're the only one that listened. See? <laughs> uh, so uh, Carter Bayzen, uh, why don't you, he, you're from Saskatchewan. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about your farm, your family? I know you've got uh, a side hustle going on as well, or maybe you consider the the uh, the cattle a side hustle. Um, well, the cow, the cow has become a side cow. hustle. Um, I've got, actually, I've actually got my cows for sale. Um, I've sold, I've got pure red Hereford cows, um, had about 100, 110 pure red cows. Dad and I ranched together but we're still separate entities um, between the two of us. We run between four and 500 cows, depending on the year and stuff with me downsizing. Now um, I think there's only going to be about 450 uh, cows on the ranch this year. Um, yeah. I, I run cars and land and livestock. That's our pure red Hereford outfit. Uh, we sell forage raised genetics, forage raised bulls, absolutely no grain, no inputs in them at all um, to sell two year olds. And then we've got Carzan Local Meats is our direct consumer beef business, as well as our new uh, beef jerky brand. Um, yeah, and we've got uh, oh, four kids now, and we're from Sally, Saskatchewan is what we call home, but the ranch is actually about 25 minutes away um, in the Touchwood Hills, just north of Cupar, between Cupar and Punishai, Saskatchewan. 
Um, that's where dad's ranch is. I rent all my grass off dad. Um, I have some land um, down by our feedlot. Our feedlot's uh, 18 miles north of Regina, right on Highway 6. Um, so I've got a few rental pastures down there, but most of it is rented off dad's ranch. And I kind of, you know, we kind of work together and the bale grazing, all the bale grazing videos I do are mine and dad's cows mixed, but it's, it's dad's land. And, um, you know, we kind of came into bale grazing, I guess, probably 10, 12 years ago. Um, we started the same way doing, doing like three days, five days, seven days. And for a lot of years, um, we were hauling the bull, hauling the bales out to the cows from a main stackyard. And that's what made sense to us. Like we, we, we come from a feedlot background. So our feedlot, like we used to haul the cows back to the feedlot from like 98, 99, we built the feedlot till probably 2006, 2007, when we bought the ranch. Um, we'd haul all those cows back to the feedlot, feed with the TMR. So when I do TikTok videos and stuff about saying a TMR doesn't pay and, you know, feeding cattle in confinement doesn't work. I know what I'm talking about. Like I've, I've ran the numbers. I know it doesn't work. And uh, it's funny because a lot of the things that I've come to love now are things that I really used to hate in my 20s that I thought dad didn't know what he was doing sometimes and questioned a lot of the things that uh, we did or why we did them. And it's only in the last three, four years where I've been like, oh, wow, he's he is kind of a smart guy, I guess. <laughs> Well, okay, so I I do want to dive into the the uh, uh, the bale grazing side of things. Uh, of course, it's a bale grazing webinar, but I am curious about uh, 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 the direct market operation. I want maybe just take five minutes uh, if you don't yeah. mind, Carter, and just talk about. Yeah, so we used to how sell. You got into it, how you web. got into it? Sorry, I was just saying how how you got into yeah. it, kind of the history of the yeah. the. I mean, the butcher shop and the direct marketing, and obviously you're you're uh, spending more time in that these days. So yeah, just just give us a a, a little bit of a plug. I know we got lots of direct marketers on today that are yeah. are, are going to be sorry if I didn't ask the question. Okay, yeah, we started. Uh, my mom used to sell all of like your anything like from the feedlot that broke a leg, your open heifers, heiferettes, cattle that didn't fit on loads, cattle you couldn't send to an auction barn, cattle you couldn't you know ship and stuff to a to a slaughter facility or whatever. We you know, we'd finish them in the feedlot and mom would sell beef into the city. And then uh, I got to say it's about 12 years ago now. Um, she kind of said, screw it. She, it was not worth the time. You know, checks bounce. There's no e-transfers at that time. So you got checks or cash. Checks would bounce. She got sick of doing it. And uh, I kind of took over doing it while I was a steel mill worker. Um, I just one day, I, I was working at Everest Steel Mill in Regina uh, for eight years. And I figured, you know, this is a great outlet to start selling beef. So I started selling my own cattle and dad's cattle, um, as a direct to consumer deal. And then I met a woman after my divorce, a Carmen, my fiance, um, she's been shopping at like local food hubs and stuff her whole life. And we were on lockdown during uh, COVID and we're like, well, what can we do? Um, I don't want to work at Everaz anymore. I hate being a steel worker. I love cattle, but our cow herd is not to the size where I can just walk away from a steady paycheck. So we thought we could open, you know, a little meat shop with some white chest freezers and brown wrapped beef, um, like a place out by uh, uh, Osler, Saskatchewan called Farmyard Market. And uh, that's kind of how we started. And then just serendipitously, the building we were going to go in closed. We opened a new business and realized through talking to guys at Everaz, where I worked during lunch breaks and stuff that, hey, like you know, white chest freezers aren't going to work. Brown paper is not going to work. So we kind of jumped into glass door freezers, cryovac, full marketing, all that stuff. And it kind of just exploded. We got in at the right time. Um, it was funny because when COVID hit, I was ready to get out of the direct consumer beef thing, just focus on selling bowls and stuff. And then the phone was just ringing off the hook. Customers from like eight, nine years earlier were reaching out, wondering where they can get beef because of everything going on with COVID. And it's just turned into a what is now our bread and butter um, right now we use it to market all of our off-aged cattle. So your, your heiferettes, your twos, threes, we turn all of our cull bulls, all of our cull cows into ground beef, into jerky. Um, so right now, like our operation, before I started selling the cows, we sold damn near hundred percent of our cow herd um, through direct and consumer, direct, direct consumer beef sales through jerky sales or through our um, seed stock business. So I always tell people like we in this business we got to be price makers, not price takers. 
And that's kind of how this evolved and grew to what it is now. Oh, that's, I mean, that's, that's an amazing story and at risk of uh, going down into a long, long tangent, I'm not going to follow up, but I mean, uh, <laughs> congratulations. And, and that is an amazing story. Hopefully yeah, it's like inspired the people in the chat. Uh, I, I know I'm going to have some follow-up quest questions with you some of the, one of these days I'm driving across yeah. the prairies. So I guess uh, I, I'm going to ask you, uh, you kind of drew the short end of the stick, Carter, by, by going last, but somebody has to. But I'm going to ask you kind of the same questions. How do you decide where you're dropping bales? What bales are you dropping off? What are you using for twine? Uh, just give us the kind of the rundown of uh, of your bale grazing operation. Yeah. Um, so we don't put up any hay. Um, we probably buy, depending on the year, we have everything's done on custom. Um, we don't own, we own one tractor for 500 cows. The feedlot's got one tractor that since we stopped using our feed wagon just sits there and we've got a, uh, payloader that we use to put bales and pens. Now the feedlot's essentially empty just after years of work. And we realized there, there's no money in feeding cattle. Um, so it's better to let somebody else do it for you. Um, so we buy 50 to hundred percent of our hay every year. Um, so the way we do it now, we are trying to get all of our land into perennial forage. So as we take off green feed and first cut, second cut off land that we don't want to graze just yet, um, or don't want to cross fence into our 40 acre paddock system, um, all that gets bale picked by bale picking trucks. And then our goal is to do kind of what Aaron's doing. We want to blanket cover the ranch and in my lifetime, I'll never do it. So we're actually thinking maybe winter custom winter and cows is the way to go to, in order to cover this ranch as fast as we can, because you're, you're still going to see, we can see 10 years, you throw up a drone, you can see seven to 10 years later, um, with your, with your bale grazing, the difference, you can still see bale rings seven to 10 years later um, with a drone. So we want to blanket cover this ranch. So what we do right now, um, the bale picking truck picks the bales off the land that we put hay up on and then goes and drops them in groups of 17. Um, and then I go out with the tractor, usually end of November, but this year I just did it two weeks ago um, before that cold weather hit. We just got busy with trade shows doing jerky and stuff. So we just kind of place them wherever works. This year, um, last year we did like a checker pattern. So and it's not ideal. It's not what, what we want, but it's what worked because of the way the bales were dropped. So we did a checker pattern. So last year we would have grazed the white, the red checkers. And this year we're going to graze the black checkers. So we put bales in those empty spots. Um, but they're not like, like Aaron was saying, um, they're not where the bales were touching. It's literally like I'll run bales. Um, I want to say they're 20, 25 feet apart max. I've got one bale on the loader and one bale on the three point hitch bale spike. I drop them at the same spot, lift my loader up and turn and drive away. So whatever that distance is in between, I figure it's 20, maybe 25 feet, but probably not. It's pretty closer to 20 feet. Same thing as Aaron, we wanna cover as much ground and never come back to it again. The way we do our checker pattern is, is we'll lay our bales, like your rows of bales here and next year you put your rows of bales in between those other two rows. And that's not the ideal way to do it, but that's how it works. And uh, we don't take yeah. any, net, we use net wrap and twine. Twine comes off, net wrap doesn't. Um, we leave the net wrap on and the cows graze. And we get a lot of a lot, a lot of flack on that from, you know, the TikTok videos I make and social media. Um, we have never in all the years of doing this lost a cow to a belly full of twine it, or a belly full of net wrap. Never happened. Um, we find that the way the cows are eating on the net wrap, they're eating from the sides of the bale in, they're eating small amounts, it's probably the same amount that you would get in a bale shredder or through a tub grinder to guys that are just dropping them in tub grinders and running them through bale shredders or pulling that wrap off. Twine's a different story. That stuff all comes off. And the reason we do it that way is we are not buying hay from the same people every year. It's really hard to find a guy that's willing to contract hay um, in the spring or contract on a long-term basis because everybody's out for the most bang for their buck, the most money. So what if you contract, everybody's got that what if scenario in their head. What if I contract it and hay goes up, you know, or we'd love to do sizal. That's the ideal goal for us is sizal twine or biodegradable net wrap, which I'm having a hard time even finding any company still making it. Um, there's been a lot of companies start and then disappear off the face of the earth. So that would be the ideal is biodegradable net wrap. But we leave the net wrap on number one for bale consumption control because we're grazing last year. Um, we started grazing two months at a time. Um, and I find with the net wrap on, they eat the bales from the sides and then you don't have them just blowing a bunch of bales apart. 
picking all the good stuff and then going back and laying on them, urinating on them, crapping on them. They clean the bales that are broken up before they start on the next bale. And that's how we... So we are worried about we start we when we started bale grading we were worried about covering hilltops like getting getting your exposed ground covered we were worried about uh, killing alkali killing weeds and now we just want to blanket cover the ranch with as much nutrients as possible. Carter, uh, sorry, the, a little bit of a delay. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, uh, we we had a great question uh, just came in, and I know Aaron does buy a lot of feed, but you're telling me you buy almost all of your feed. So yeah. the question. Uh, good Good question, Cole. Uh, is it worth spending one hundred and fifty dollars a bale to bale graze if you have to buy all your hay? What's oh, the I, what is your logic for being for being able to do that? I got numbers for you on that. <laughs> okay, so I I do I do want to uh, go through the numbers. It's going to be my first question for all you guys. Okay. Give me the Cole's notes. Okay, so it it bugs me when you got to buy feed. It bugs me when you got to write the check. But when you start looking at the financial benefits of what you're doing to your soil and the long-term benefits, the the water retention, creating a water bank, bringing in somebody else's organic matter, bringing in somebody else's nutrients off their ranch. Because when you harvest, when you harvest feed on your own farm, you're taking away all your nutrients, all of that organic matter off someplace on your ranch and moving it to another place on your ranch. So what was the point of that? And I just started looking at that, looking at it that way the last couple of years. Um, if you can bring in somebody else's nutrients, somebody or else's organic matter and leave your nutrients and your organic matter where it is and use that as stockpile grazing or use that as, you know, just leave, like we've got land now that we leave and we calve on it like it's stockpile, but we, we don't graze it like we used to. We used to graze all of our stockpile grass and then move to bale grazing. Now we leave stockpile for next spring and we'll calve on that stockpile, take out bales to kind of supplement them as they need it and financially when you start running the numbers that i've got you could pay up to 300 dollars a ton for hay and still justify buying all your feed great answer uh so i, I again i i i don't have to be too specific as far as questions carter uh but talk about what's going on here we're not in perfect rows anymore what's going no on? i don't do perfect rows i'm not ocd i'm just <laughs> So this is this year's, this is a picture of this year's bale ground. Um, what I'm doing here is putting the bales where the gaps were from last year, just trying to cover all that ground. And this paddock had been grazed twice this year, but we left it kind of midsummer to regrow. So you can see visibly, like that's kind of the skiffing of snow we had when I put the bales out, maybe a little bit less. And you can still see the difference in the grass growth um, so we put those bales on that ground that hasn't been grazed before, and then we'll never come back here again. Uh, same as Aaron, we're covering between 40 and 80 acres a year on the ranch. So it, it'll take our whole lifetime to cover that. So, uh, got a question just came in, which I think is, is relevant. I mean, I guess I can answer, uh, part of it, which is, uh, when you've got a good winter and you carry over feed, do you do anything with those bales? Do you move them around or just leave it and add to it? Uh, and I guess so I'll start. Uh, I have sizal twine. Uh, we move a bale one time and it stays there and uh, there's no other moving the bales. Uh, it makes a mess, but talk about, uh, I'm sure you've had years like that, Carter, and kind of what's your guys' strategy? We don't. Um, I put out enough bale grazing to usually get us to first to middle of April. And then one thing that dad does and the way we were doing it before was we don't put cows on grass until the grass, we let that grass get ahead for, for every day you can stay off the grass. We figure is another week of grazing you can get in the fall, but that was kind of our old way of thinking. We're changing our grazing. Um, so we'll probably be getting on grazing this year, probably mid April, but we always do middle of April roughly for uh, bale grazing. And then we have bales in, in stacks closer to the road. Um, or we'll buy, we'll, buy more hay in the spring and take that out to the cows as they need it. We never have bale grazing left over. We'll make them clean it up in the spring. Um, sometimes a little too much. Sometimes your old ways of thinking come back and you, you want them to lick it to the dirt. You want, because for us, uh, I know you keep asking guys about how much waste is waste. I don't look at any waste as waste. Um, we figure about 10, 15% max, but the waste you're having is organic matter you're putting down. And I got numbers on that too, and like how much NPK you're getting out of that organic matter. 
and you that organic matter you're leaving down like i know aaron showed that one picture of all those snow drifts between his bales and if you look at those pictures that he showed with the little pods of snow in the middle all of that wind or all that snow that catches in those bales like a porosity fence your cows stand on top of that drop hay on top of that urinate and crap on top of that and then that's a water bank so about three years ago we were in a drought and it was the middle of july and i wanted to show guys that how good the bale grazing ground was so I drove up on the bale grazing ground to take pictures of my truck beside all of the growth with all of this brown burnt off grass around it. And I sunk my truck up to the axles in mud on top of that bale ground. And you dug down with your hands and you, there was snow in the middle of July. You know, a, there's a lot of waste that year for sure. But it's a water, it's a sponge. It's a water reserve is what you're leaving behind. So the, there's no such thing as waste for us. So, Carter, something I think is important to talk about. Uh, we were chatting about it uh, beforehand, but I guess, I, I mean, unbeknownst to me, I, I did not realize you guys were the same. All of us are doing, uh, uh, you know, you know, longer term uh, moves, whether that's, you know, 15 or 20 days. And I got asked the question before uh, from somebody who was not a bale grazer. We were having a heated discussion, but it was a great discussion. And he said, well, OK, you went three days, five days, 10 days. Now you're 21 days. Why not just open up the fence and let them go? That's what we, that's what we're, that's what, that's where we want to get to. And like, so, so tell me, tell me why, I guess why you're not, so you, you uh, teased at the start, you guys are up to two months moves. Yeah. What are you seeing as far as, uh, I, I, again, we've gone over, I'm going to use the term so everyone can understand it, waste, the stuff that the cows aren't feeding based on like what you were calculating, uh, how many days you were going to get out of it and and where you got to and then what's the hold back from going like if you're wanting to be 120 days uh on winter feed what's holding you back from just doing that one paddock so so last year i had heard from somebody that nervouses aaron were letting all of their cows into all of their bales for the whole winter and we're having good luck doing it so aaron came out to the ranch this summer to look at my cow herd and uh and visit and stuff and uh found out that that was a bunch of bs <laughs> so everything that i developed off of our, our grazing plan last year was a bunch of bs but it worked um <laughs> so the way it started we started with our we've always done three and then five and then seven and we always stuck to that seven days maybe two weeks ten days two weeks but we we're always worried about cleanup and then we stopped looking at cleanup as cleanup anymore and we started worrying about keeping the cows in good shape making sure that we're leaving organic matter making sure that we're leaving nutrients behind and not worrying so much about licking that 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 hay up and stuff but then last year i wanted to do two months of bale grazing and essentially it was dad's cow herd and mine were just along for the ride so he said no 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 well they kept busting out and i got sick of putting them back in and i like th that's why aaron does what he does with putting the pods farther away and that's what we used to do um so I just said, screw it. I rolled up the wire and gave him the whole pod. Um, what was left, there was two months of feed there. And within three days of when they should have cleaned that feed up, they were done. And still in really good shape. Like last year, our cows were probably in the best shape they'd been in before, up until this year. Our, our cows are, every year, the cow's condition gets better and better and better. And What's holding us back is the fear of change. I'm I'm big on change, but we still have that fear of the unknown. Well, I, I'll uh, I'll double that. I didn't have a good answer to give him. Uh, no, it's the fear of the unknown for all of us. Well, and uh, I got, uh, we got, I think, I think this is uh, your last picture, Carter, but I'll just tell a, a short story where it's like, I, you did a great TikTok. I, I laughed my ass off uh, talking about lazy farmers, lazy bale grazing farmers. Uh, it's really good. If, if you guys haven't seen it, you should check it out. But uh, I mean, it's not like we move cows to a 20 day bale grazing and that's see you later. That's the last time we'll see you in three weeks. Like we're still checking them. I actually tell people, I'm like, it's changed my relationship with our cows because it used to be in the wintertime. You're out there every day. And in November and December, that's cool because, you know, you're looking for something to do. But by the time March comes around and you fed cows for 150 days straight, you're, you're just looking for a break. And, you you know, you will flat tire or blown hydraulic hose or, or whatever. And you resent the cows because you're like, oh, you 
damn cows, you know, you're the reason this happened to me when in all reality, we're, we're just doing this to ourselves. Yeah. So the relationship with my cows changed because I was just going to see the cows when I wanted to see the cows, you know, you missed them. You wanted to see them. You wanted to see the condition they were, they were putting on. You're, you're more observant because you're there to observe. You're not there to feed. And I, it's just been such an amazing switch for my, uh, and something that doesn't get talked about, which I give Aaron full credit for is something that doesn't show up on a balance sheet is quality of life. And that's yeah. not just quality of life for the humans that are involved. It's quality of life for the, the animals that are involved as well. If you got but any follow-up, it's not that, just it's you, not just the the relationship with your cows. It's the relationship with your family, the relationship with your friends, the relationship you have with yourself. Your stress levels are way less doing what we're doing. Um, like we we stockpile grazing into January, and then the cows go on the bale grazing, and it's changed our lives. Like my dad's dad's a full time cattle buyer. He's on the road buying cattle full time. I've got a side hustle. Um, when I was working as a steel mill worker, like you would go up there on weekends and move a fence or whatever. I, or when dad can't make it up, I'll go up and we could alternate up each other, but still do these side hustles that we enjoy doing. Dad loves being a cattle buyer. He loves visiting with customers and seeing other herds. I loved working as a steel mill worker for a while. Like I miss the guys and, but I love our jerky business. I love seeing my kids spending time with my kids. So it, it's the, the relationship with yourself and your family and your friends that really benefits out of doing it this way as well. Um, well, Carter, talk about what's going on here in this picture, and then uh, we're going to get to questions because we've got <laughs> like forty to get to. So I'm going to do my I'm going to I'm going to get asking you guys questions, and then uh, kind of go through sift through some of the uh, what people are curious about, and kind of try and uh, uh, accumulate this. But what's going on here in this picture? Yeah, so this is where this is how the bales get dropped by the bale picking truck. Um, he just kind of drops them spaces them out and then I place them where I need to space them. So you see the bales are in lines right there. So that was last year's bale grazing. And then this year I'll fill in those gaps. And the only reason we did that was just try to conserve fuel, try not to drive bales all over the place to lay them out the way, we, you know, initially they probably should have been laid out. Um, I think what we'd like to do is more of what Aaron's doing um, and put them in our whole ranch is cross fenced into 40 acre parcels. So maybe put enough bales for a month or two months in each 40 acre parcel and do it that way. Our fear was coming back to ground and, and knowing where you were last year. Originally we first started doing this, but you can see it uh, like clear as day, even in the lushest conditions, you can still see where you bale graze. So the, that's what I'm doing. There's space in the bales. This was November lot of 2022. Hey, well, okay, cool. bale grazing for us, it's literally three days of work burning two tanks of fuel to put out enough feed for your whole winter for 450 to 500 cows. Like that's all it takes. I, uh, my brother and I were having a conversation. So they, uh, everyone back home, uh, weaned I'm out in Alberta. So I, uh, I, I was not there sadly, but he said, what do you want to do with the bulls? And I'm like, well, the bulls can either stand in the corral and eat cover crop, and I got to keep the water open for them all winter and feed them and bed them, or they can go with the cows and eat cover crop all winter, and I don't have to worry about them again. Last year, I literally spent twice as much time with 11 bulls as 200 cows for the entire winter because the, the the creek doesn't freeze up, and you know, if you had to, you really didn't have to even be there for uh, you know for a couple weeks. So, okay, you guys, I got a, I got a ton of questions to get to. So um, maybe just if you can be mindful for time, I know this is the pot calling the, the kettle black here. Um, but if, uh, if you can try and keep your answers, you know, concise and to the point or whatever, as I drag on and on and on. But I, the first thing I wanted to open with, because I need a bit of time to, uh, to uh, collect some of these questions is the cost of doing chores. Because we always talk about what uh, our feed cost is per pound, what it costs to put up a bale of hay, what it costs to buy a bale of hay. And then that the conversation is over. We stop talking about, uh, there's no more expenses once we purchase the hay, uh, whether that's time or equipment or whatever. But I, I know Carter, you've, you've said you've broken down the numbers, but I mean, Aaron, you're obviously a thoughtful guy. And uh, Luke, you obviously based on your, your winter feed practices are very mindful of this as well. So maybe we'll start with Luke and Aaron and Carter. And uh, I, I mean, just touch on a little bit about uh, the cost savings of, uh, you know, Luke, in your case, you can talk about corn grazing and swath grazing, but 
but just talk a little bit about the cost savings you see on your farm um, with uh, utilizing some of these practices. Yeah, like the savings here are, are huge. You know, like our yard, yardage for the cows is it's very minimal. Like Carter says, we set it all up in the fall and and we let them go. And yeah, it's a little bit of work. You got to watch them and stuff. But I mean, it's 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 it, the yardage for the cows is not that much. You know, we could. It's amazing what you can do in the fall. We do. I we do it a little bit different than than uh, Carter and Aaron. They, they they you guys try to cover it smaller area quicker we do a little different, like we'll cover a bigger area, but I'll be in that same field for four or five years. Right. And I think that's the wonderful thing about bale grazing. We could, everybody do, do what works for you. Right. And it's a little bit different, but it, it works for us. Right. And what are, I don't have an exact number for you for, for, for our yardage, the way we do it right now, but I know if you're to feed cows every day with a tractor and a feed wagon, it is, it, you know, everybody's going to have a different number, but it's way more if you're going out there with the tractor every single day and the thing with bale grazing we can go quite a bit further right now we're swath grazing five miles from the house so you can imagine having to go feed those cows there every day with a with a tractor and a feed wagon i mean it would take you hours to go feed a group and now they're we would check them a couple times a week that's it pretty simple Aaron, yeah um i know when i when we're placing our bales in uh August and September, I usually tweet out that uh, ongoing yardage because that's that's when our yardage happens, basically, is when we're setting up the bales. Um, and and a benefit of bale grazing, too, is if you're if you're buying feed, for example, and you buy it from somebody, it never comes to your yard. It goes straight to the bale grazing site where in other systems, you, a lot of times you'd bring the feed home. And then when you when you did feed it in winter, you'd be taking it from that bale yard out to the cows. So there's an added component of yardage to that as well um so i guess when we get our bale set up we pull all our twines before it frees up we try and get it done around thanksgiving and then once they're off we're good for the winter there is no more yardage because we don't do any manure removal we don't do any we don't harrow or anything we just leave everything as is to decompose naturally and and that's pretty much it we will check them pretty much daily. I'll go up there in a snowmobile if we can't get there with a truck, depending on the winter, but about 30 minutes a day. And that's it's not necessarily that I have to or that it's a, it's a necessity, but um, it is good to just check on them and see how the general herd health is. Make sure the water's working properly. We do use water. We don't rely on snow because we have it and we have that resource, so we utilize it. I really think that the bale grazing is more efficient if you have water source. I'm not saying it can't be done on snow alone, but we prefer water. So we're checking the water to make sure that we don't have to break ice and that it's flowing properly. And then we're also maintaining salt and mineral for them. And that's pretty much it. So we are going to come back. We've got lots of questions about uh, winter water and mineral. It'll be the next question. But uh, Carter, I know you've... you've uh, you brought a gun to a knife fight, so let's hear some I numbers. I did. I did a TikTok on this, and a lot of guys called bullshit. So we'll see if uh, Aaron and Luke know better. So I, I, I broke got a, down. I got a pretty sharp pencil with my cattle operation too, so I can help out. So I broke down just what is left on the ground after you're done. If you figure ten percent waste, and based on what a cow urinates and defecates per day. And then roughly, if you figure 10% organic matter left behind, the organic matter off the bales alone, we figure about 27 bales to an acre, is what we're putting down. And organic matter alone, you're looking at $334 a ton or $334 an acre in NP and K benefit to your soil. So it doesn't matter what the how cheap the feed costs are. You got to start looking at what you're, what you're doing for your soil. And then with your... NPK breakdown of 12 tons, 12 pounds per ton of N, four pounds per ton of uh, FOSS and 12 pounds per ton of potassium was what you're getting out of a cow for the year or whatever. Um, it works out to $830 an acre of NP and K that you're putting down right there alone. Like it, that's the cost savings that offset anything else you're putting in, you think you're putting into it. Like we figure a hundred dollars a day, just in fuel. If you got to feed your cows every day, that doesn't include 
having somebody work for you that doesn't include breakdowns like that's everything you break down in november sure there's a lot nice if you're fixing stuff than breaking down at minus 40 in the winter which is a lot more chance of breaking down but it works out to 90 for our cow herd it works out to ninety three thousand on 80 acres roughly ninety three thousand dollars a year in np and k that you're putting down like and that's got a 25 percent uptake the first year and then you've got it'll use a third of those nutrients every year after that. So a third of that, third of that, a third of that, a third of that over seven to 10 years or whatever until it's gone. So that's for us, that alone makes this whole deal worth all of it. That's why you can pay up to $300 a ton for, for hay and not have to worry in the end. So um, I think you bring up an interesting point and there was a question. I want to give a shout out to Dean. Honestly, I'd give me a hat, but uh, he's a covers and co-dealer. So he's got lots of hats. Uh, Luke, I know you mentioned that you bale graze on sod, but the question was uh, using higher quality bales and bale grazing on productive land that we're going to grain farm. I guess, Luke, I'm just wondering if you've done that. And uh, I have a follow up because I, I love the idea. Uh, we no, we haven't tried that. We've tried a lot of stuff, but we have not tried that. We all our land, yeah, no, we haven't tried it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I cherry picked this question because I've got a great answer, and I'm the host, so I get to do whatever the hell I want. <laughs> uh, the the I am not kidding when I say high quality feed. These guys have all reiterated it, reiterated it. There is so, so, so little waste that's there or residue of any sorts. Um, and before that, uh, this webinar in 2020, uh, time flies, Aaron, but that was four years ago now. Uh, we did not have a disc drill and we were uh, using, it was the first year where I thought that's great, <clears throat> fixing salinity spots, hill tops, but, um, you know, say canola or corn is, is worth a fortune. Can I start actually improving uh, our grain land and our actually productive land and feed on that? So we set out some really high quality bales and with our uh, 8,800 Borgo shank drill, it still was not enough. The The residue was, what little was there was plugging. Um, but since then we purchased the 750 John Deere disc drill and it's we feed on our grain land. Now, of course, depending on the quality of the feed, uh, you know, there may be a bare spot that's six feet wide, but it is a practice that if you're using high quality feed, high quality feed is going to break down uh, uh, quicker anyway, because there's a higher protein source, there's higher nitrogen, uh, it's a more balanced C to N, so like that residue is going to break down uh, and they're going to clean it up better. So I, I think there is a ton of potential of actually uh, utilizing high quality feed on productive land. And uh, we were going to include soil tests, but it was cattle farms on, and I knew that there were going to be a ton of questions. But the sheer just amount of nutrients Carter went through it, the value that's there, like what that it's probably the best way to realize uh, uh, that input cost or that waste is by, uh, you know, growing a ton of grain on it. I know that nobody's set up for, or not everyone's set up for grain farming, but on our operation, I see a ton of value in it. So uh, next question, you guys, uh, maybe uh, just touch a little bit, lots of questions on uh, the mineral package. Uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna start grouping these together so we can try and get to as many questions as possible. Uh, mineral package, winter water, and different groups of livestock. So are we just grazing cows? Are we grazing cows with calves by foot? Can we graze, uh, bale graze uh, with weaned calves? So maybe we'll go in reverse, Carter, and then Aaron, and then Luke. But uh, just a re refresher, Carter, water, mineral, uh, uh, and different groups that you've bale grazed with. Uh, bale grazed different groups. We used to do everything, uh, bulls, first calvers, second calvers, mature cows. Uh, last two years, we've taken the bulls home. Um, we have never had winter water up until this year. Our cows have licked snow for the last 20 years. Um, so we've just got winter water for the first time. And maybe they do better now that they got fresh water up there, but we've taken the bulls to the feedlot. We found that their conditions just dropping, especially the last two winters where it's, you know, you're getting 30 days of minus 35, minus 40. Um, and then our first calvers, we have bale grazed a lot. Um, this year, again, they've gone to a custom feeder. We always look at the dollar value of, uh, can we get somebody else to feed them cheaper than we can feed them in the end? Um, so we've shipped them off to get fed better somewhere else. 
Um, so we usually keep our second calvers, first calvers, second calvers, and our mature cows separate. But I like what uh, Aaron had to say. So that's got me thinking about other stuff like that. Um, mineral, we don't give our cows mineral. Um, they get a garlic Redmond sea salt. Um, we haven't done mineral. I've done mineral on my purebred cows. Um, started wondering why uh, dad hasn't given his cows more than two pallets of mineral a year for, I don't know, the last 10 years. And they do just fine, have the same conception rates as everybody else around us and never really worried about it. And we worry about it less and less and the more research we do. So I think that's one thing we won't be worrying about. Cool. Aaron? Okay, I, I think I touched on the water already. We have, I'm a big believer in providing water. If you can, if you do, if you can't have it, I think cows can go by on snow. It depends what they're trained on as well. If they grew up on snow, and I've heard this from other people, like you stick, just stick with the system. I don't think cows can have water for the first five years of their life. And then you go to an area where they bale graze and then you just give them snow. There's going to be a huge adjustment factor for them. So anyway, we provide water because we have the resources to do it. Uh, mineral, we just provide free choice Redmond salt in, in one tub. And then we also, we also use mineral tubs that we've started using for the last two years. And they're a molasses based tub, low consumption. They're not high protein. They're just a 365 mineral program for cow calf. And we also get garlic in and we feed the garlic year around as well, just because it's easier. And you're not like trying to guess when you're want to like start giving them the garlic in spring or, or prior to fly season and not have the products. We just give them garlic year round. Um, what was your other question? What's the third one? Uh, different groups, different groups. Um, so our cat, like our females. So every breeding female is together. So that's everything from a year of age to as old as we got purebreds, commercial all together. And that's the bulk of what we feed in the winter. We also do have some other management groups. So our calves, our wean calves, we kind of do a modified bale graze at times, depending on the year. But we will roll out a couple bales. We'll leave a couple bales standing and we'll feed them every, uh, you know, two to three days kind of thing. So that's that's what we do with them. The herd bulls get a modified bale grazing as well. Um, yeah, was there, was there one more question or not? Was there a fourth one? I mean, just straight calves was the would be the more specific one. Sorry, what was that? Like, like straight calves, like wean calves. Are you? Uh, I, I mean, basically, I think the question is more: uh, Are they as hardy as the 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 cows? Are they doing as good a job cleaning up? Are you keeping them twenty days, or you know, moving them every three? Yeah. No, I I don't. I think calves need a little special treatment. And they will not clean up nearly as well as cattle cows will. Dry dry cows or bred cows, they will do an amazing job, way better. And I think there's also something to higher numbers as well. Like not everybody has a large herd, but a larger herd, there's there's a there's something going on there where they will clean up better. And I think it's <clears throat> just the competition, you know, between them. You know, when cow looks over, there's another cow beside him. Oh, I better eat something before she does. Like. Uh, there, there's a cleanup factor to a larger herd as well. Yeah, I agree. Luke, sorry if you, uh, we're talking about water, mineral, uh, and different groups. Okay, so for, for water, usually our cows are on snow. I prefer water. If we have water, or I like water, but the most of the times they're on snow. It's a little tough this year because we had none, so we had to modify and make things work, but snow works best. Of, snow works. Uh, Still works well. Uh, mineral, we give them a uh, uh, fifteen-seven uh, molasses mineral. Uh, like Aaron says, that's they don't consume a lot of it, but we we do give them some tubs. And uh, groups, we usually run them in two groups. So one group is the commercial, the other group is the purebreds and the heifers who run together. So Luke, I we well we actually graze corn stover uh, and and intercrops. Shout out to our uh, corn intercrop webinar that's coming up. Uh, but we used to graze just straight monocrop corn. And of course, we're bale grazing a modified system just, just like you. Uh, and I'm wondering the difference in consumption, if you've experienced the same thing that we experienced going from either, uh, you know, swath grazing or, or bale grazing to corn and the difference in mineral consumption between those two practices. I haven't noticed too much of a difference. We'll use that same mineral when they're on swath grazing and corn, but I haven't seen a big difference in consumption. 
No. Oh, well, our experience and honestly, one of the reasons why we started uh, not going away from, uh, well, I guess uh, conventional corn grazing, as you know, it is we there was always the mineral consumption just went skyrocketing when we moved to the corn. Uh, and this was back before, I, you know, I understood the importance of diversity of plants and minerals and, and whatnot. But that was one of my aha moments was, OK, what's going on here? Uh, it seems like, you know, our, our mineral consumption is three times as high in the corn versus, you know, even hmm. something like swap grazing, which, which lots of people would consider out there or cruel or, or, or whatnot. But I always thought that was an interesting observation. And, and, uh, right now, so our cows are actually at home. They, uh, they just got weaned yesterday. So when I'm back in Manitoba on Thursday, we're going to move them to, uh, uh, 400 bales of, of full season cover crop. And it's always amazing to see that when our cows are utilizing uh, intensive plant diversity, so lots of different plants, the mineral consumption just drops down to next to nothing, um, just like that from the feed source. So mm. it's just an observation that I've had and something that uh, I always find interesting uh, every year. So yeah. I'm going to keep roll going to keep rolling here, guys. Uh, lots of questions to get to. How are we deciding how many bales to put out? Because like the quality is going to um, vary depending on the bales and uh, how flexible is the program if uh, it turns like it did uh, a week ago and it's minus 40. So maybe we'll start with Carter and then Luke and we'll finish up with with Aaron. So just the, the question is, how are you calculating uh, consumption and how flexible is the program based on, you know, the weather? Yeah, so we uh, the bales we pick off our own land, we weigh like a representative sample goes over the scale. So we know roughly what our bales weigh. And then everything we buy crosses the scale. We don't buy anything by the bale, it's all by weight. Um, so we weigh everything that comes in. And then we kind of figure your, your, your 3% of their body weight on dry matter per head per day. And roughly that works, you know, 37 and a half to 45 pounds, depending on the cow. And I, we kind of figure 40 pounds a day on average and uh, give them that many bales for, you know, your two weeks, your three weeks, your month or whatever pod you decide to give them for that amount of time and then make them clean it up as good as we feel they need to and we'll move them on to the next one. And quality and stuff, we we feed test usually. Um, there's years that we, you know, there's loads that come in, we don't get tested. There's years we don't get it done. But we try to feed test everything and then the bales are already placed. So you just got to kind of roll with it. You got to be able to roll in with bale grazing. If you can't pivot, pivot's the most common word in our household and on on the ranch like if you can't pivot you're going to fail at this like you've got to be able to evolve luke um yeah so we have we put up our all our feeds so we don't buy anything we put everything up so we don't have any twine everything is net wrap but we take everything off in the fall and uh we don't place them as tight as as as, as carter and aaron but like i say we'll hit that field for about five years in a row and if we pencil in that they're those that group of cows, and it varies from year to year. If we pencil in that they're good for, you know, 30 days, we'll usually get that plus or minus 30 days. So that's what we plan. Three different, and we've tried one big field, two big fields. And right now, what's working well for us is three different sites. So three different ponds. About 170 bales per, per pond. Cool. Aaron? Yeah, we use 3% of body weight as well uh, as fed basis. I think that's what you meant too, Carter, Absolutely. right? As fed, yeah. So that's what we use too. Um, so we just, yeah, we have everything pretty much weighed too because we're buying it. Um, not all of it, but most of it. So yeah, that's what we base it on. And um, each of our pods are around 360, 370 bales. And yeah, we have some flexibility too. Like this year when we, it was mild, we, you know, we didn't give them that full pod. Uh, we gave them a third to start, but that actually, actually that pod was 21 days as they all are. And it ended up being close to 30 just because of the mild weather. So the cattle will, <clears throat> will regulate themselves to a certain degree. But when the flip of that happens and it's minus 40, a 21 day pod may only last 18, 17 days. That's just reality. So they, they just adjusted themselves. And I will, I will touch on something here before I forget. We talked about why not go longer than 21 days, right? I yeah. I think, you know, we've talked about it too. Maybe in the middle of winter, you know, that 
two pods, making them one and go 42 days. But I think you got to be careful there. 21 days seems to be our, our sweet spot. And like the problem with more than 21 days is early on in, in winter and then spring, when mild conditions appear, you got to be flexible. And I don't, that's where I don't want a 42 day pod. And the other thing with a 42 day pod is what happens when you get to, you know, day 32 of that pod and you get a massive snowstorm. Like there's some risk to that as well. I was just going to ask that. Yes. So you mitigated a little bit with 21 days, I feel. So uh, Aaron, let me follow up that question. You guys can all answer. Uh, what about a 21 day pod? We've got, we're on day 12 and we've got 30% of the hay is spread out. Uh, I mean, I guess what's the worst case scenario from if I'm a devil's advocate, we get a foot of snow and there's bale spread out. How much of that are like, how much more quote unquote waste are, are, are you looking at experiencing or what's the worst you've ever seen? We, we've never had it so bad that it was like, man, that was kind of a disaster of a pod. I mean, sure. There might be a little bit more waste, but um, I don't know. The cows seem to sit like the last three days. They will just sort of sift through everything. I mean, they've got all the time in the world to do this, right? They've got nothing else to do. So they just sift through it with their nose and they find the crumbs of hay. They really do. Is it realistic to think you're going to get maximum efficiency if you get a big dump of snow like that? No, probably not. It, it probably You probably will have more waste. But that's, I guess, the cost of doing business of the system. And it, it, there's no perfect system. So... so Carter, maybe take a stab at that. Uh, I mean, you were doing it last year on two months. Did you ever experience something like that? Like a, uh, a significant weather that set you back? Oh, yeah. And like with, with the net wrap on, it's not a big issue because they're right. Like right now, the, the cows are on their on their two week paddock right now, their first two week parcel. And uh, they've only got what the heck was I counting the other day? They don't even have 50% 50, 50 of the bales open yet. So like they're they're eating from the sides. That's why I'm, we're not worried about the net wrap because they eat from the sides. They're eating little tiny bits here and there. And then when the bale busts apart, those cows mob it. So if they bust it apart and there's two feet of snow, those cows are going to mob that bale, lick it up. You go and you grab the net wrap, pick it up and it's done. But it's the cows will dig. Like a, a lot of guys that say that there's like the swath grazing didn't work for them because the snow was too deep. I've seen cows in swath grazing where you can't see the cow anymore and digging into a hill, like a, like a gold miner. And all you see is snow flying behind her as she's digging and grazing in front of her. And she's the smart one and all the other cows are coming in behind. It's no different with bale grazing. Cows will walk into a, a drift, walk down and start eating into a bale. Just like you saw in pictures of, of Aaron's there. Like when guys say they can't do it because the snow is too deep. I don't know. Like if your cows can find a bale, if, if the bale is visible in the snow, they will get to that bale. Yeah, just don't tell the cows it's too deep. Exactly. <laughs> Luke? Well, that's why we like all three or four systems, you know, like it gives us a little bit of variety. And like the guys are saying, you know, these, if you feed these cows every day, they become lazy. But if you treat them like, I always say my cows are athletes, my cows are professional athletes and they go out there and they work and I'm not going to, you know, like I said, sometimes they'll supplement them just a little bit to clean up, but like, trust me, we don't do this a lot. But these cows, if you treat them like, like athletes, they become very good athletes and they will dig and forge and do what they got to do to survive. It's amazing, really. That's what I that's what I call my cows. I think my cows are athletes is what I say. And the coolest thing about this is you were talking about us being from Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. And here we are looking at a Hereford guy, an Angus guy and a Charolais guy, right? I mean, I think that's pretty cool. You can make all the, it doesn't matter what kind of cow you have. She could be red, black, pink or purple. If you make those cows work, they will work. So yeah. I got a, I got an interesting one. I, I got an interesting one here, guys, from the chat. Uh, I I, th I think this is so interesting. So let let's say uh, I'm taking my 200 uh, cow herd, and I say Aaron, Luke, Carter, I want your best offer on wintering my cows for the winter. What are you going to charge me a day? They're 1,300 pound cows. Uh, what are you going to bet? Because uh, and the thought process goes as followed. Sure, the value of feed is one thing, but uh, I guess how much lower can you go uh, versus, say, a feed lot? And you know the benefit that's coming on the other end, which is the urine, the manure, and the residue that's being left left behind. 
Are they bringing? Exactly. The, are they supplying the feed, or are you supplying the feed uh, in this room? Uh, ooh, good question. Uh, <laughs> no, no, you're going to supply the feed at, uh, and it's your cost is seven cents a pound on forty pounds a day. So two two dollars and eighty cents. We'll call it an even three bucks uh, feed and mineral. What are you going to charge me? The feed that's, lot a Carter, is, that's a Carter question. He's the numbers yeah, guy. Yeah, he's, he's the numbers guy. He's probably got this I'm all I'm going to charge you as much as possible. <laughs> I mean, There's, that's I, fair. We, like, I don't know. We, we've, we've been thinking, like, that's the only way you can cover ground faster is by bringing in custom cows. We do custom grazing as well. Like, I, I think if it was worth it and you could find a, a good – so it's, it's hard enough now finding feed for your own cow herd, so – Find and feed for somebody else's cows, it's not even a question I would answer because the, the guy wouldn't have enough money for me to feed them. <laughs> okay, okay. Here's a, now another fun exercise. I'm going to haul all the feed to your place and I'm going to haul my cows there. Are you going to charge me anything? I'm going to charge I... you full custom rate of feeding cattle that the next guy would charge you. But it's I'm giving you opportunity, you opportunity I'm cost. You... It's I'm called opportunity you... cost. <laughs> you are good with numbers. Yeah. <laughs> okay well that was a bit of a tough one okay so lots of people have asked uh about wildlife uh we've actually got burnt in our system uh one year we took uh, all the net wrap off 150 high high quality alfalfa bales and had no plan to get there till march we had hundreds and hundreds of deer they made a bloody mess so uh lots of people are saying oh the elk are too bad the deer are too bad i mean i think carter you've probably got as good of a solution as any but uh, Luke, why don't you start? Then we'll go with you, Aaron, and then uh, Carter to finish up. Well, we we've, we've been at these grazing systems for twenty years, and only the last two years it's been bad. So, uh, they yeah, they did some damage. It's not every year. It was bad for two years out of twenty, so that's not too bad. And this year we have no snow, and we don't see the deer. Right, they're still out there in the bush. We don't we haven't seen them really. Um. We're lucky we don't have elk around. There's not, there's no big elk herds around, so we're very, very lucky that way. Um, the deer were most once they found the leftovers in the corn, they were staying there, so it wasn't too, too bad for us. We didn't have a lot of damage in the bale grazing fields. So, but I, I can understand in some parts parts of the country, it would be, it could be a wreck. Aaron, yeah, same thing. I mean, there's a big difference between elk and deer. Huge difference. Yeah. We don't have we don't have elk here. Yeah. I mean, there are elk not far away, but there's just no local herds right near our place that we need to be concerned about, at least for the time being. Um, deer, yeah, there's lots of deer around here. Where we bale graze, it's kind of on the open plains, so they tend to not. There's way less bush up there, although although there are bluffs for the cattle to go when it's really crappy, but the deer tend to not want to be up there too much. Um, we have got some damage, but it's usually closer to spring. And by that time it's, you know, it's, it's minimal for us. So it's, it's not really a concern, but I can really feel for some people that it's not an option for, because I mean, if you've got large herds of elk, they'll just, they'll just decimate bale grazing. Yeah. For us, um, we got lots of deer. We got a huge deer population, but they don't bug us because everybody around us grows corn. And uh, they're just in everybody else's corn and they don't bug our bales. Um, elk, on the other hand, we've seen an elk population explode, um, whether that's because of the bale grazing um, or because of all the corn in the area. The elk population has absolutely exploded around here from, you know, you might see five or 10 animals four or five years ago to now you're seeing hundreds of them. Um, last year, we didn't lose that many. We still lost a lot of feed, mostly once they urinate and defecate on it that's when you're starting to see cattle not want to touch it anymore. Um, I think we lost 45 or 50 bales last year to, to elk. Um, so they're a problem. And one thing we've tried doing is keeping our cow herd between where the elk are coming in and the bales. So we always move the cows towards the road where they're set up now, keeping them between the elk. Um, it seemed to work until the weather really got cold last year. And then the elk moved in and they're just walking through the cows you know, eating our stockpile grass when it started getting exposed in the spring and eating all the the bales that were open. Um, and they, I find though that the elk around here, they prefer stacks. So they started eating at the stacks that we left. They weren't coming into the individual bales. 
unless they were busted open. Why that is, I don't know. Um, so we've also placed our stacks on this far side of where the elk come in to the ranch. Um, but if, if that population keeps exploding with no control, I don't know what we're going to do or how we're going to manage that. Find a different way. It, it's you pivot. You just you got to learn to pivot. You got to find solutions that work. Um, okay, I'm gonna. We had lots of questions, so I had a tough time. I'm I'm gonna give the uh, the uh, jacket to Harold Stark. So Harold, in the comment section, if you could put your address, that'd be great. Cole uh, Dodgson, you're gonna get the hat. Um, so I got two more questions for you guys. The first one is. And I think it is relevant because, um, you know, sometimes I mean, the, the year after bale grazing, of course, you get that beautiful ring, but there are some things that come with it, like thistle, I have noticed, uh, you know, and some other stuff. How long do you do you see it takes for, I mean, everyone uh, on the panel is is uh, is bale grazing on native, native pasture or native ground. So we'll just stick with that. How long uh, before, uh, I guess, you see the native species? 100% come back and then maybe just a follow up you know how long do you see it stay greener for how long can you notice that 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 bale pot paddock for how many different years so uh Aaron maybe start with you and then Carter and then and then Luke okay yeah we probably like so we probably have a little bit more residue than than most people in terms of what's there for that that thatch layer that smother layer to start and in year one after it doesn't look that impressive there you know that there's just a lot of residue and it takes a long time to decompose now year two it's, it's when you really see grass coming year three and year four are probably the max production years in terms of increased grass and then it will just taper off slowly after that but i mean i think joe you've been out to our place and we've walked into places where you know we bale graze uh four or five years ago. And it's when you walk from non bale grazing into bale grazing, it's like night and day. Um, we can still it's see. Probably, like, it's probably it's, three or four times the production and you guys are in a, in a well-managed grazing system. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. And we can like Carter mentioned this too, about like how long, like how long can you actually see differences when we first started bale grazing 20 years ago, that particular past year, we can still see patterns in that in that past year of bale grazing. Now it's not as dramatic, obviously, but you can still see the differences in the grass production 20 years later. Now that wouldn't happen if you, you know, you, if you didn't have proper grazing management and you were just say you were kind of a seasonal open grazer, well, those results would get nixed pretty quickly. But if you manage your grass properly after bale grazing, I think those results are are infinite almost. Carter? Yeah, we don't. So a lot of guys on, especially on like social media and stuff, they think that, you know, you're smothering the grass and it kills it for us. That first year you'll get some patches here and there. There'll still be some, some residue left, but the grass explodes right through it. We don't have problems with dead spots. Um, weeds aren't weeds. We stopped looking at them as weeds. They're in mother nature's cover crop. Like there's a reason those weeds showed up or why they came in um, and they'll go away eventually. And if they don't, there's a reason they're still there. Um, so it's not a big deal for us. And like I told before, like seven to 10 years, we're, we've only been bale grazing for 10 to 12 years. So seven to 10 years, you can still throw up a drone, see the effects of where you bale grazed. But we used to do it so sporadically. Like we'd try to cover hilltops. We'd try to cover alkali spots. We'd try to put it on, um, you know, where you didn't want brush growing and stuff. But we only um, bale graze on our tame forages. We don't bale graze on native prairie. We use our native prairie as... Uh, standing hay in the fall kind of a deal so we don't put anything for bale grazing on our on our team forages but yeah we we don't see any drawback on grazing we actually see an increase in grazing that first year we're doing 40 acre part uh, paddocks three four day moves um, and you'll see the benefits that first year we'll leave them off longer like we'll let that paddock rest where we bale grazed for probably most of the summer into the fall sometimes for the whole year and then use that as stockpile grazing in the fall but sometimes you know with drought and stuff you got to get on there in the late summer so we'll throw them on it and you, you can hardly tell like other than the soft spots where they're still wet underneath that's about the only you know impact you could see on ours can i mention something real quick you betcha yeah well what we found too is like the next year bring the cattle through 
and and make it a really intense short duration move it's amazing what the hoof action will do to 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 start breaking that up breaking and increase the the decomposition yeah don't put in don't take equipment in there and like guys are asking about harrowing that land and stuff to break up that bed pack don't don't even touch it don't take any equipment out there just leave it let the cows do all the work and you'll be amazed at what it can do it's cosmetic right. it might look better it's short, but it's short term gain for long term pain. It's it's not worth it. Luke, pretty much what the boys said. You know, uh, you might see a hot spot here and there the year after, but after that, it's not an issue. It's even better year three, four, five, ten down the road. And we our bale grazing is on. Um, it's not a native grass. It's tame, but uh, yeah, it's you see the results for years and years to come. So I got a I got a quick story. So we also learned about bale grazing from uh, uh, holistic management. My parents, thank God, they have an open mind, or I wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, and right, we live uh, just off Number Three Highway, and we're a half mile off the highway. Right at the corner is the worst salinity spot you have ever ever seen. White with salinity, and it was probably fifteen years ago. Uh, Dad, because he had taken holistic management, went out and put uh, straw bales in circles he didn't put them close enough together but to this day uh that is a salinity spot and uh foxtail grows in these little circles where 15 years ago uh there were straw bales put so it's just i, I mean of course uh, great point carter a weed is not a weed and it's mother nature's answer but literally the only reason anything is growing at all is because 15 years ago there was a thousand pound straw bale put on you know that eight foot ring um so guys, I'm down to the last question. Uh, so I always ask uh, final thoughts. So I'm going to get a little bit more detailed and, and feel free to be a little bit uh, more long-winded um, if you want, if not, all good. But what's something that you wish you knew when you started bale grazing uh, that would have made your life a lot easier? So say, let's say, oh, I mean, everyone's been doing it for 10 years. So let's say 10 years. And then where do you see it 10 years in the future if you see it changing at all? So uh, maybe we'll go Luke, uh, Carter, Aaron, but what do you wish you knew 10 years ago and where do you think the system's going? Oh boy. Well, I think that's the wonderful thing about this system is that we're always changing and adapting and growing. And like Carter says, you got to be flexible and, you know, you know what you know, right? And I, it's just by talking with guys and guys like you guys and guys that are willing to try stuff that we are where we are, right? So I, we we are where we are because we learned all this stuff and it was talking to positive guys and where it's going in the next 10 years, but well, we're not quitting, that's for sure. We're going to just keep going. And 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 like I say, we're we're three guys from different parts of the world and it's all all different, but it's all the same at the end of the day, really. And the improvements to the land is really what you have to look at. And people are too fixated on the waste, 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 waste. And it just, it isn't, you have to look beyond that. And the benefits are massive. And it's fun having a guy like Tartar, he's a numbers guy. So it's like throw it his way there. <laughs> but, you know, and it's, and it's other things too. Like I was saying, like, you know, it was taking notes and it is the savings and the labor, the labor of going out to feed cows is, is, is crazy expensive. And the quality of life, like you were saying, how do you how do you put a price on that, right? I mean, you, I don't think you can. So, uh, and where it's going to 10 years, well, like I say, we'll keep going. It's not changing for us. I hope bail grace for another 20, 30 years. Great answer. Carter? Um, I wish I would have known. Um, listen to listen to open-minded people and keep your keep an open mind yourself always keep learning um if if we hadn't been if we'd pay attention to what our neighbors are doing we'd be growing corn right now and probably going broke like there's just there's easier ways to do it make your life easier and like working off the farm most farmers are working off the farm why not do it this way like for us like in, if i knew now what i would have known then um that like waste isn't waste um three five seven days like go as long as you can try different things um yeah like we got we got one tractor for 500 cows and it like in the winter it runs maybe i think last year i figured it out we, it ran for 13 hours last winter like 
that the, the savings alone right there. But 10 years from now, I don't know. There's a lot of things that I want to change this year. There's a lot of, a lot of changes I want to make for next year, like cover cropping and cover crop bales. And I've got some friends who are die hard corn guys that are going cover crops and just killing it. And I don't know, there's 10 years from now, I hope we're, you know, doing what we're doing, but doing it better and, and more cows on less land, more cows with less bales, more cows with less work. That's the only way you can make money in this business is more beef per acre. And that's, and I like when Luke says I'm a numbers guy, I'm not a numbers guy. I just kind of, my dad used to be a numbers guy. And honestly, until about four or five years ago, he used to bug the shit out of me. But <laughs> it took me a long time to, uh, to come around. Aaron, before before you go, I gotta I gotta tell a quick story about coming home from the holistic management conference last year. So I if uh, if I just love conferences, it sucks that the pandemic happened because I it's just the the speakers are one thing, but it's the I learn the most from the producers that are there because everyone's got ideas, everyone's got time to think, and then you know you come to these uh, conferences and everyone's just excited, and it's just a sharing of ideas, and it's I. I always leave just feeling, you know, motivated and, and passionate. So anyway, I was at the Worcester conference. I was actually on a bale grazing panel and uh, I left there. So I had tried an experiment for two years that I really hadn't told anyone about. Uh, I looked at a bale grazing spot and uh, where it was poor quality feed and there was residue. There was all the ingredients for life and no weeds and nothing, nothing was growing. No, no weeds. No, no, nothing was growing. <laughs> And uh, a podcast that I follow, uh, Regenerative Ag Podcast with John Kempf. John's always talking about how decimated uh, uh, human food production, the vegetable uh, production acres are, and how horrendous the land is. And in 20 years, we're going to have to figure out how to grow vegetables someplace else because the soil doesn't have that much time left. And I looked at these spots and I, I use residue in my garden and I thought, well, the cows have made me a, a perfect residue bed. And uh, I made it my mission that I'm going to figure out how to grow vegetables on uh, wasted uh, residue on our bale grazing acres. So anyway, I went to the conference and I wasn't crazy enough to tell anyone the idea there. But the second I got uh, driving home, I picked up the phone and I called Aaron. And I said, I need you to try an experiment. <laughs> we need to start trying to grow vegetables in bale grazing residue spots. I know Aaron didn't have a lot of luck and I actually didn't have a lot of luck either, but Boy, do I have plans for the future on that one. I, I'm going to be laying tarps. Tarps, exactly. The soil doesn't warm up uh, soon enough. And I think that there is something to maybe uh, putting it on farmed land versus native land and breaking down roots and stuff. But anyway, just a quick story of where I, what I'm excited about in the next 10 years. And Aaron, you get the last word. Um, What I wish I would have known earlier, I... Uh... Yeah, I, I guess maybe that, you know, pushing the envelope on on the the length of the period, like your grace period, uh, that would have been kind of nice to maybe know a bit earlier because like like you said, for, for us in our system, that's it's been a game changer for us going to a 21-day system. It's been really nice. And I guess the other thing is just like not giving a shit about what anybody else thinks. Like, like that's huge. Like there's so much... I don't know, stigma and farming about like what's your neighbor doing or what he's going to think like who gives a shit like find find something that works for you and go with it, it you know I mean that's they're, they're, it's a nice feeling and it's very empowering when something works for you and it's maybe not a, a traditional method it doesn't have to be who who writes these rules right um yeah that's about it one thing I want to mention before I forget um, you know, we're talking about these these 21 day moves and stuff, and you might have like people on here from Eastern Canada or from the States. Like that's one benefit that we have here in the prairies in Manitoba. Like, it, you know, it's we have a deep freeze for four months. And so those 21 day moves might not be possible for people in Eastern Canada or say, you know, uh, the East Coast, like let's just say Ohio or something like that. So I, I just think I just want to make that distinction that you know, it's it's a really good system here in the prairies, but it might not be a, a good system elsewhere where you have that freeze thaw effect. That's it. I knew there was one advantage to living in this deep freeze. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Stop yes. making good points. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm finally adjusting, Aaron. Uh, Aaron was in Mexico and I was in Nicaragua at the same time, so we were texting back and forth about winter at home. Uh, I didn't think I was going to come home. I thought I, maybe my wife was going to leave me there. But anyway, I'm happy to be back, and thanks for pointing out the positives of winter here, Aaron. There are a few. Well, there are. Uh, anyway, uh, well, I very small few. Um to everyone that was on, like I said, this was our most attended webinar uh, ever and wasn't even really close. Uh, so hopefully you guys learned something. I really enjoyed the uh, the panelists. I appreciate you guys so much for, for taking the time, offering your honest opinion. Um, I should know what our next webinar is uh, off the top of my head. Oh, it's uh, Managing Salinity. So we had some Salinity questions here tonight. Tune in February 5th. Uh, and anyone, everyone have a great night and thanks a million you guys for coming on. And uh, yeah, cheers. I appreciate your guys' time. Thanks for having us. Yeah.